systems. Um, today is uh, the last um, uh, talk uh, uh, of the politics series uh, for this year, and also it may be perhaps the first uh, that the politics uh, uh, for this year also have been uh, composed and co-organized uh, with the Zolberg um, Institute for Migration and the Mobility. So the last and the first. It's a great honor uh, uh, for this occasion to have uh, uh, Professor uh, Michel Agiel, who is also um, uh, a visiting professor at the Politics Department and has been uh, very active in our department, but also uh, in, uh, in Zim. And uh, uh, I will uh, just uh, uh, avoid uh, uh, a formal uh, introduction. I will say just uh, uh, the, uh, I will give uh, just the institutional uh, affiliations uh, of, uh, of Professor Agier and uh, then uh, um, uh, Miriam from uh, the Zim, uh, from Zim and the Anthropology will say a bit about the most substantive uh, parts uh, of Professor Agier's work. So he, uh, in addition to being a, a, a visiting uh, a professor for the spring 2015 in the politics department. A professor Agier is also the exceptional uh, class research director uh, at the Research Institute for Development in Paris and also the studies uh, director uh, at uh, the School for Advanced Studies in the Social uh, Sciences. Uh, he has also taught in many uh, universities around the globe. Uh, prominent and very well-known uh, anthropologist uh, with emphasis on um, uh, migration and related uh, issues that uh, uh, today have come at the forefront uh, of uh, uh, global politics. And uh, I think that's it for the formal uh, uh, references. Uh, Miriam uh, can take care of the substance. <laughs> <laughs> right, so one thing we're really grateful to, to Michelle for doing is bringing us together, bringing the politics department, the anthropology department, uh, the Silver Institute on Migration and Mobility together. Okay, sure, we can project better. Um, so yes, we're very thankful to Michel for this, and he's trained in anthropology and philosophy, but I think his work is preeminently and predominantly about politics, so bringing these all together is, is really wonderful and fortuitous for us. Um, as Andreas said, uh, Michel has done work all over, sorry, all over the world, um, in South America and Brazil, in Europe, and various places in Africa. He's done ethnographic research in all of these places. But I think his work that touches on uh, the theme, certainly for the Zilberg Institute, which is Rethinking Refugee Spaces, Design, Architecture, and Politics, um, he's been doing work on this theme at least since 2002. And one might say he is the foremost scholar on these themes, on the idea of refugees in the camps. Um, he started by writing a piece about the uh, urban anthropology of refugee camps, um, and he initiated a really important dialogue with Lisa Malky, who at the time was, I think, the foremost um, scholar on refugees, or anthropologist on, on, on refugees. Um, and since then, Michelle has written actually eight books, single authored books, on these topics, not to mention the many, many co edited volumes and articles. Um, he started with On the Margins of the World, um, and then managing the undesirables, refugee camps and humanitarian government. These are only a few of the ones that are also published in English. Um, and most recently, he's uh, finished an enormous research project called uh, Un Monde de Camp, or so a World of Camps, um, which has had great publicity all over France. He's been in all the TV stations and, and all the major newspapers and so on, and they're talking about this. And as Andrea said, he was just in, uh, in Paris talking about the recent uh, horrible drownings of people from trying to make their way from Libya to Lampedusa. Um, and so he, he's, the, you know, the, I guess the foremost voice on this and taking on these very, very pressing questions uh, of, of, of the undesirables, where they should go, where, you know, what should we do? Should we open the border? Should we create more camps? And so on. <laughs> Somebody just asked me about that. Um, uh, in his work, Michel has, has spoken about uh, humanitarianism as the left hand of empire, um, showing the humanitarian industry's complicity in a world made up of camps. And he's thought about the different types of camps um, that are part of this larger camp world, including um, self-organized camps, uh, the traditional refugee camps, detention centers, detention centers, camps for uh, internationally, uh, internally displaced people, and so on. Um, but in thinking about them as a series of, 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 um, of spaces that we can put one as, beside each other, can think of comparatively, 
he refuses to think about them as spaces for the warehousing of their life. So he, he does not go along the lines of Agamben. Instead, Michel's work shows how politics can still take place in the camp. Um, and he draws on thinkers like Jacques Concierge um, and calls for us to examine what politics would look like. How do we recognize it in the camps? How does one come to voice in these spaces? Um, in other words, he opens the space for us to recognize new forms of politics um, and urges us to, to, to engage in this kind of important research. So today he's going to be talking about these questions and, and much more, focusing on borderlands and border men. And please join us in welcoming you to the Jedi Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to Miriam and to Andreas for this uh, invitation, and thank you to Patrick to make all this possible in all of this year's year. As uh, it was said, this lecture is about borders, borderlands, and bordermen, or border women. And um, I could not not mention, of course, the recent, very recent events uh, in between Europe and African uh, continent. Since the beginning of 2015, at least 1,600 people died in Mediterranean Sea. But this number has hugely increased these last days with at least 400 drowned persons on last Thursday and at least 800 on last Sunday, the day before yesterday. The worst hecatomb ever, see, ever seen in the Mediterranean, according to UNHCR. This violence, or even this war on the borders, is part of a general crisis about mobility and immobility in the contemporary condition of the world in the post-war, the post-Cold War era and globalization era. According to International Organization of Migrations, IOM, 40,000 people died between 2000 and 2014 in all the world in the crossing of borders, land or maritime borders, including 22,000 on the European borders and 6,000 on the US-Mexico border. In October 2013, when 360 drowned, 66 drowned persons were recovered in Mediterranean uh, near the island of Lampedusa, the major of Lampedusa claimed for taking and spreading images of the tragedy. Otherwise, she said, it would not be recognized as a fact. And the emotion in Europe on that moment mostly came from the fact that faces and bodies of the migrants could be seen as hundreds of singularities and not anonymous categories of illegal migrants. Just for a while, for some days, we could see bodies and faces of the person. So that we can say that being dead, this this uh, person uh, became suddenly subject to being dead. Of course, in this context, the political consequences and therefore the public responsibility um, are evident for any researchers in social science who takes as an object of investigation the question of the human globalization or the global mobility of human. What can we reasonably say about the contemporary when our problematic is so polemical and sometimes tragical? My investigations are with people in move, workers, refugees, wanderers in Africa, Middle East, and Europe. Because of the major difficulty to cross borders in the present context, they are in a certain way stuck in the situation of border and in the condition what I call border man. Perhaps we can have an idea of what I mean by border man with the image of the labyrinth of the stranger 
that have have had shoots that brought from his experience from his own experience in uh, New York City as an exile, a Jewish exile in New York. Um, he talked about the cultural codes with which the migrant arrives, um, confronted with the cultural codes of the place where he arrived, and then, um, in a certain way, the migrant is objectifying one and the other, the cultural codes where from where it comes from, and the cultural code of the society of welcome, which is not so welcome, says shoot, because this is exactly what is a, a labyrinth for the stranger. And then the migrant um, builds what he called the concrete intelligence of the um, born in the border. And that's probably the, the main idea that I would like to develop here, this specific culture or intelligence of who is living in the border. What happens when the subject doesn't get out of the labyrinth should speak about? It becomes, the labyrinth becomes his or normal context. And it determines a long time experience of the world in the in-between, neither in one place, never exactly arrived in the other. That is why I will associate uh, or try to associate the hypothesis of the borderland to the description of border men. Borderland could be the common concept for landscape, one more global landscape, the sixth global landscape to have a variety of landscape, who knows, borderscape. Or um, the context, the, common, the, the, the concept for uh, borderland as a, as a concept for the context where these uh, situations of border, border situation could be considered by ethnographer like new situation of contact in the British anthropology tradition um, where the alterity is um, a reality, a concrete reality of the daily life. In other words, some figures of mobility that I will just present are, I suppose, or I make the hypothesis, associated with some kind of space, encampment, camp, squat, and this hypothesis um, comes also from the fact that I think that the, the geologistical of the world is now a part important, an important part of the organization of the world, uh, forming constructing not only identities or assignation to identity, but also assignation to spaces, to territories. Finally, these border men in long-lasting context of borders can lead us to a new conception of cosmopolitanism, not like an um, elite good life, but like the banal everyday life of people facing the roughness of the world. All this question for me appeared um, in a very radical and concrete way when I was in Patras in Greece in 2009 uh, conducting a research with uh, Sarah Christiani, who is a photographer, takes the photos, and um, and who was coordinator of the uh, association Migre Rock, which is an association who joins uh, associations, organizations, and researchers. I'd like to describe this situation kind of abstract of the world. Uh, in that moment in February 2009, every day on the end of the, of the afternoon, around five o'clock, young migrants were running behind trucks and, as you can see, trying to open um, the doors of the back part of the truck so that if they succeed in opening the door, one or two others will enter in the, this back part of the truck and try to hide 
um, below the the, the the changes. But they never succeed. And I was always affliged by the fact, looking at them, never, never I saw them succeed in jumping on the truck. And I thought it was kind of a ritual, it was daily ritual. They needed to give kind of meaning on their uh, waiting time to support the moment that could last weeks, months, or sometimes years, and people were there in this situation, this place, since more than two years. I will come back to the, this waiting, waiting situation. But of course, who succeeds is who paid to some um, the, the, the driver of the truck some kilometers before the port, and then he can hide in some part of the truck that will pass the different control um, and get in the ship. What we don't see in this photography is that on this situation that I, I, I want to describe for you, um, in the same situation there is on the beside, on the same road, there is a car of policemen. Um, they are looking at them, um, discussing, laughing, and uh, not preoccupied by the fact that these migrants are making something illegal uh, every day. Um, then the policemen look at them without moving. They know that other controls after them will be made. On the parking, when the truck arrives, the parking before going to the ships. And then after, inside the hold of the ships, there will be other uh, controls. And at the arrival in Italy, which is the aim of this uh, tentative of uh, journey, in, in Venezia, Ancona, or Bari, um, they will be, they will be controlled, the, the ship will be controlled newly by other uh, police, policemen. On the same scene, on that moment, on the other side of the street, there is a fitness club with people um, making bicycles and uh, running on carpets. <coughs> and there is a window on the wall of the, uh, of the uh, um, club. And um, I was there when I saw exactly the people running on their carpet and looking to the migrant women behind the, the tracks. And then, of course, I was, <clears throat> I was a bit disappointed and uh, looking at this like some, what we call the politic of indifference. Um, you can go anywhere in the world, but not in my backyard and so on. But of course, we know that in Europe nowadays exists some kind of engagement it exists, uh, although it is very complicated <coughs> to engage in association and organization between the police solution and the humanitarian solution. The political solution is uh, quite complicated to, to elaborate and to, to manifest. I I will continue with this um, um, same, same people or same um, group of migrants um, to describe uh, in which way to which to where they go after uh, after um, Patras or eventually after La Belisa. and um, it is something like uh, wandering on this borderland which has no end and which can be seen by the proper person in this situation like an adventure. Wanderer is an ancient figure um, as um, it, it has been or it is still something the wonder is something that can be considered good to be think, good to think. 
it is the marginal man, it is the outsider, the errant or the nomad with no proper place, with no fixed residence. He has the freedom to go and come and um, Simon, John Simon has written very nice things about this figure of the stranger. He is the African nomad or the Jew errant. One of my first fieldwork was about itinerant merchants in, uh, in Africa, in West Africa, and all the Hausa, the Hausa um, uh, um, merchant from pre-colonial to post-colonial uh, history were specialized in moving from one city and another. And it was um, the, first, the first group who create its own encampment, which are called Songo. And, um, and then we can see a figure of a kind of groupment gathering on the border of the, of the city. Uh, which is associated with this, with this mobility, with this permanent mobility. This figure gets, uh, gets wider today and um, gets wider and more complex uh, today. It, we can look at it as a trip around around Mediterranean Sea. Uh, there is a circulation in all around the Mediterranean. In North Africa, uh, with the um, so-called uh, enclaves, Spanish enclaves of Ceuta and Melilla, where people from uh, Central or West Africa tried to pass, or also coming from Libya now. Um, in uh, East Africa, with the situation of the Libya, which is well known in the the present uh, situation. Um, people from the Middle East or from further uh, uh, Afghanistan or Iran who arrive to the south or the east of Europe, to the Greece, to Italy, to Spain and also to France uh, in Calais or like in this photo or in Paris. The, this uh, this um, situation, we, we can have something like a, a, a landscape of all these people arriving and stopped on all the borders which are around the Mediterranean. And then they make some um, recruitment in some uh, places. They are places of waiting, of uncertainty, of places where the people can elaborate strategies. There, are, there is now quite a good lot of studies, in, um, monographic studies, on some of these places, all on the Sahara Desert, with some places where people regroup and try to organize to go further. Um, or on the south of Spain, uh, in uh, Aleria, for example, or in Italy, of course, in the Malta, Lampedusa, or in Greece, and so on. All these places are, are, uh, are uh, well known. Well known. Um, in Almeria, in Andalusia, the moment that comes just after the uh, crossing the, the border, is a moment where the people try to think about how to go further. Is it a good solution to stay working in that place in the south of um, um, in Andalusia? Um, it's a situation where the migrant is in a very high vulnerability, but uncertainty, but also a time where um, the people try to inform to get to look for a solution. And they discover on that moment that they are clandestine or clandestinized or illegalized. Illegal. On the other side of the Mediterranean, 
on the uh, south part in the city of Raba in Morocco or in the forest near to Ceuta Emilia, there are places that are called uh, ghetto or tranquilo, which are places where mig migrants group by small group numbers and in the same way try to understand what how the police is working, how the people of the place are reacting to their presence as stranger and what they can find as a solution. The space of a border or a border space correspond to this figure, which is the encampment. The encampment can be um, on the border, like what's on this photo of uh, Tijuana, or the encampment can be also in the city, a urban, a kind of urban encampment, when the people pass the border and don't find a legal place to stay, then there are profusion of small encampment in the interstices, in the small places uh, of the border of the cities or border of the neighborhood. These uh, Afghan people here are uh, very near to my house in Paris, 19th arrondissement, in the, in the Pont Jaurès. And they found this place on the beside of the, of the bridges and uh, beside the Rio Seine, the River Seine. Um, there are uh, other encampments which are more well known, like the encampment of Patras in Greece or the encampment of Calais in north of the France. The, camp, the encampment for Afghan and before for Kurd, Iraqi and Kurd people uh, in Patras, uh, sheltered from 500 to 2,000 occupants, according to the moment, between 1997 and 2009. And the encampment of Calais in the north of France uh, occupied, um, ex has existed from 2002 to 2009, and uh, sheltered until 600 persons. Other encampments developed in the main places of uh, bottleneck, between the borders when the people cannot pass, um, like in the forest, uh, in the forest between um, the enclave, Spanish enclave of Ceuta Emilia, or uh, in um, in uh, Tijuana, and near to the border of uh, Mexico and uh, the United States. When a new person arrives like in Patras, he first goes to the um, building which has been squatted by the people just beside the barracks of the encampment. Um, and then he looks if there is a place, if there is a room for him in the shelters. Or then, if there is more than one people arriving, then they construct the shelter in something like one day and there is uh, we can describe all the architecture of the encampment uh, by a collective group that makes the shelter in one day. Mahmoud is the person like, who is presented like the leader of the encampment. Um, in, his, in his real life, he is a social worker. But there, in the migration, he circulates between Patras and Athens. Um, he has two small. He has one of the two small shops of the encampment, and he says, "Patras is a city out of law." The paradox of this. Um, the paradox of these out places of this encampment is that. On the case of Patras, after 
12 years of existence. The encampment has, has become a um, landmark place, a fixed point on the multiple roads of the migrant. The name of Atlas is known by all those who try these roads. As, as well known as Zaidan, on the border between Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, as well known as Calais, on the north of France, or Gare de l'Est, as the people know, the, the main station in Paris, the neighborhood where there is um, this kind of encampment. These places became partly, in part, cosmopolitan crossroads. They are steps of journey who have all the world as a scale. A journey always risked, unpredictable, and a journey for which for them now goes from Afghanistan or from Pakistan or from Iran to Europe. But the exile can change its perimeter as he has changed for the African exile, is changing for the African exile that goes to Europe, because Europe is on the post-colonial um, um, uh, logic of uh, looking at places um, from the, the ex-colony to the ex-metropole. But now it is changing, the places are changing, and more recently, African migrants go to Middle East, go to uh, Asia, or to uh, America. The second, second uh, figure of this border man, I can name it the Paria. The Paria and his place would be the camp. We consider that 12 to 15 million people live in camps, refugees camp or IGP camp in the world, not counting then the encampment centers, um, the retention centers, etc. The radicality of the otherness of the being another the radical alterity of the people in this camp um, comes from the exact um, um, localization in the camp. The camp has three characteristics that we can uh, recognize and consider that they can be the definition of the camp form. The extraterritoriality, that means the camp has always a place out of the normal place, or like Lisa Malki said, the normal order, the national, normal and national order, and the extraterritoriality. But I would add two aspects of the camp. The, the first one is the desidentification, desidentification of the refugee when he is in the camp. This identification, he has lost, he has lost what composed what compose his identity in the place that he left, and he has not received another identity given by the others, as he received the identity from the others. The, the identity needs the external identity or identity given by the others, and they are they have no identity given by the other. Uh, unless the category of uh, refugee or encamped person, person who is in the camp. Then there is the, 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 produce, the production of the camp is the disidentification of, of who is in the camp. But in the other side, the refugee camp in the refugee camps in their real life are also cosmopolitan crossroads. Lasting zones of waiting, what do they become? They become 
sometimes kinds of cities or sometimes kinds of ghetto. The, these um, thousand or thousand and five hundred camps that exist in the world are all different. Some are some are transforming uh, to um, urban ghettos, such like in a um, Palestinian refugees camp uh, situation. Others are huge villages, which is well, they are called, they can be called villages, but they are not exactly villages. And they have also of the characteristic of what could define the urban context, although they are not necessarily recognized and called uh, The metek and the squat can be considered like the third uh, figure of uh, border men and border residents. In Beirut, many immigrants are considered like bidun. Bidun is a word that means without, without everything, without document, without visa, without authorization, without property, but they are working. And um, there's many examples of uh, families that are formed by migrants in such situation after many years, people who are living in um, um, generally um, informal or illegal occupations and who are um, building families like uh, a family with a, a man from South Sudan who works like a cleaner in a restaurant and a woman from Sri Lanka who work like a domestic worker and they are established in Beirut since uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the woman has fled from the house where she was working as a slave, she said, because as many people from Sri Lanka or Bangladesh she arrived in Lebanon with a contract that obliged her to work for nothing in this house. And then the only solution for her was to flee. flee. And, um, and then she could, uh, in the same time, work in, for an agency, for a domestic worker, and be illegal because her, her her owner or her, um, the pe person, family with which, where she was working, uh, they kept her passport. And then she must be without passport to be able to work. She must be illegal to stay in the place. If she looks for her passport, then she will be um, arrested and, um, and she will not be able to work anymore. It's a, it's a stability in the marginality, which is very frequent in, in Beirut. And, um, and that, and that make, think, make me think of the very ancient figure of the Metek. We need him in the city, but we don't recognize his existence. He is economically, or she is e economically uh, useful, but socially undesirable. And, um, The squat appears like the possible urban form of this illegal, illegal presence um, as city dweller, city dweller without rights. The squat of Gaza Hospital in the neighborhood of Sabra in Beirut is a um, is a place which was open. In, uh, it's a squat which was opened in 1987 by three women coming from Shatila camp, from where they had um, they had uh, <coughs> fled because of the internal war in the camp in 1985-1986, and they were followed by many people on the days after their establishment in this building. This was an old hospital uh, which had been 
built by the uh, LPO in the 70s when LPO was established in uh, Beirut, and that's why its name is Gaza Hospital. It had been abandoned and partly destroyed um, after uh, 1982, and, um, and it's nearly um, in the ruin that this person established. Um, many years after, 25 years after, this place is a very important squat in Beirut. There is 128 apartments where live more or less 500 people. I was wondering about my, my problematic about this, this place was the possibility of this place. Where, where does it come from? Uh, why was it created and why, how does it reproduce since 25 years. I think there is many explanations. One is the history of Palestinian refugees losing their status uh, and looking for a place somewhere around the camp. Another history is the story of the migrant workers of various parts of the region, of the Middle East, arriving there. Um, Syrian, Lebanese, uh, Iraqian, but also from further, Egypt, uh, South Sudan, or North Sudan, Bangladesh, and so on. And uh, the, pro the result of the history of the conflict of the Middle East um, with other um, moment of people arriving from Palestine, of course, but also Iraq, Syria, and so on. And finally, this place is possible because of the history of Beirut. Uh, it is located in the south, um, in the south suburb of, uh, of Beirut. It's located in the south suburb of Beirut, where it is uh, included, it is a part of the neighborhood of Sabra, which is in, uh, uh, um, not so far from Shatila, but it's not a camp, it's a neighborhood, and it's known by the, it's, it's considered right by the people of, the, of Beirut, like a so-called cosmopolitan zone of misery. To finish this uh, presentation, and I'm sorry if it's a bit long, uh, I'd like to resume this relation between placemaking and mobilities in the most precarious condition. Um, or better, what is the borderland? For the wanderers, we can say that the desert, the sea, and the ports are the borders. That's where they can find themselves sometimes in makeshift encampment, or that's where also um, they can die. The Mediterranean is a border and is a place of violence. For the metek, uh, migrant workers without document, Sudanese, Eritrean, or Sri Lankan working without document in Beirut, for example, we can say that all the city is a borderland, a place of danger, a place of threat, and the people have has to, um, to know the city, to be very urban, to know the city, to know the place, to know where they can circulate and where they better not circulate. And their place, and their place is logically in the urban illegal occupations. The squad can then uh, become the place of their ordinary existence. These different places, the encampment, the camp, or the squad, are installations conceived as temporary, precarious, but they <coughs> represent also a certain stabilization in border situations. These are situations where everyone 
discover discovers uh, his her relative strangeness with regard to others, the others being one kind of others who are those who live in the cities where themselves they cannot have access or just have a limited access, and other others being the one that they discover in the same place where they are established, in the border. And what happened then in the border, um, as I put, that they are also the proper borders are cosmopolitan places because there are people coming from diverse various countries or um, various languages, various uh, kind of um, religion, thinking, and so on. Um, we can consider the, these, these places like new contemporary worlds, at first incomprehensible for the people who arrived there, and not only for the ethnographer when you arrive there, incomprehensible for everybody, but where slowly everyone has to display a kind of cultural work to understand his place where he lives and the others that he meets there. From this experience, everyone gains a certain distance in relation to his proper identity or of origin and a certain understanding of what is global, that means what is happening in this border situation. This leads me to conclude with some remarks, observation about um, perhaps something that would be um, a cosmopolitism of everyday life. What could be this new cosmopolis I talk about in the title of this um, lecture? We know that there is three uses and meanings of the word cosmopolitanism from which I will take my distance. One is uh, the good life of the global class, a very visible minority, as um, Bauman uh, said. The other one is um, the political project of people who consider themselves like citizens of the world, perhaps we all here. But to be exact, then we are speaking about cosmopolitics and not exactly cosmopolitanism or what cosmopolitics or what we call in front I don't know here alter mondialisation alter global mm -hmm. uh, third conception the one we have from Ulrich Beck is the cosmopolitan conscience conscience when we take conscience of the global when something happens somewhere and spreads around the planet through the media and tells us that we are concerned by um, uh, a risk, a virus, or a performance, an entertainment that happens in other places in the world and that we are um, uh, looking or uh, taking conscience like uh, everybody. I, I oppose to these three <coughs> common definitions of um, cosmopolitanism what I think is really a cosmopolitan condition in all the meaning of what condition is, experience, um, as the banal everyday cosmopolitanism experimented by people who are in this labyrinth of the, um, and, and, uh, um, and who meet there um, the rest of the world, other people, other languages, other culture, and who are making uh, this um, cultural work in the same time that, that they try to pass, uh, to cross the border and they finish to be living in the border. I just want to clarify that, that um, my fieldwork um, corresponds or is very near to the fieldwork and to the analysis of researchers who have uh, since many years spoken about migratory cosmopolitanism, like French sociologists and interviews, or 
abject cosmopolitanism like Tutanius, or popular cosmop cosmopolitanism like uh, Gustavo Lins Ribeiro and uh, Nina Lick Schiller, who worked since many years on transnational migrants, and ask now in a very recent work, whose cosmopolitanism, whose cosmopolitanism when we speak of cosmopolitanism, um, of whom are we speaking? There is a link between the studies of migration and the study of the transnational, the global, or the multicultural, the diasporical, the creolization, and so on, and other, other, um, other uh, social scientists have uh, developed this, uh, this point. And that is why I think we can develop this idea that the cosmopolitan condition is not only or not exactly linked to a sociological category of uh, popular, of worker, of um, illegal. Even if the fieldwork comes from this situation, this cosmopolitan condition is linked with the border, is linked with every situation when, when we are fixed in the border. And it seems to me that something like a, a new culture of the border might be um, perhaps uh, developing and that we can observe it through the observation of migrant um, workers, refugees, and so on, um, um, passing uh, or um, living in the borders. The cosmopolitan context, which um, can be um, considered like a global culture in the making, uh, on which base a cosmopolitics can be um, think as possible. This cosmopolitan context is the context of what could be a cosmopolitics, and perhaps this could be um, a contribution at least to the discussion about multiculturalism. Um, I was speaking about des desidentification. When, the, when the, the people are in the borders, when they are um, in the situations of border, there is a feeling of strangeness in the people who are established in the place regarding to the migrants coming from outside. But these migrants coming from outside are already distanced from their territory, uh, encouraged for their familial, cultural, from, from, from the place where uh, they come from. And um, the outsider don't correspond anymore to the identity that the established attribute to them when they see them on the um, arriving at the borders and when uh, they uh, define them according to national, ethnic, or racial etiquette. Um, from this situation of, we can say, double desidentification, desidentification um, from the society of departure and um, and um, desidentification in relation of the assignation of the society of arrival. From this, uh, from this situation of double, double desidentification, we can uh, treat perhaps of the question of the cosmopolitan subject. He is, um, he is another subject. Um, distinct from the identity assignation that the welcome society gives him, attributes to him, um, or even acting against this identity assignation. This distant distanciation and the symbolic vacuum that it provokes can lead the migrant to try to want to, to, to make his migration more beautiful than it is and to reconstruct an image 
and a narrative of the self like an adventurer and what we need in this situation are people who think like adventurer and this is the last image with where people who pass the frontier who pass the border and uh, are not anymore stuck at the border they jump over thank you very much Desidentification means that the person who, who are there are always saying, oh, they have lost their identity. They are looking for their identity. They are reconstructing identity. There is something about always about identity. That means for me that identity is not an explanation for the, for the social tenses. What does it mean, this insistence of being lost, being disidentified? It seems they have, it means they have they have lost their goods, uh, they have lost their land, and they have lost their relations, their links. And if you if you consider for everybody what is identity, look at the identity is relations, goods, land, a place. If you have no place, if you have no links and you have no good, you are in crisis. And the, the people there in this situation are in crisis. And I frequently, I have seen frequently in this, mainly the refugees camp, but not also because in some squad in Italy, for example, um, the squad for the building, which was the squad for Ethiopian and Sudanese people, the only external uh, Entity who was there was the Red Cross who had the place. And in refugees camp also, there are people coming there to take care of the psychiatric situation of the people and giving them uh, distributing. I, I, I went during all the day with the nurse of MSF in all the camp distributing um, medicaments, medicine for. Uh, depression and, and so on and so on. And then say, okay, hey, what's something is happening here with that you have a humanitarian response and you have also of course a political response. Okay. This and, and, and that's why this kind of, of, uh, of image is, is very strong for the people. It's not a it's not a dangerous image, it's, it's a positive image. It's something we have won. The, the migrant is something the migrant is somebody who is walking who is going on the front, on the, on the, on the march. You know? and, uh, and this is the, the, the migrant as a subject is him. That means he's not, the des desidentification made him uh, in this vacuum. And uh, being a subject means to walk, to go, to go front, to try to pass uh, the border. It's very interesting. In other MS Mets, uh, Medicine Sans Frontières context in Paris, um, I went to the unique center of MSF in Paris, and it was very interesting because the, uh, the doctor explained that when the people are in the move, 
they are stressed, they are more with anxiety or perhaps avoidance. And we, when they are stopped in the center or in the camp, they start to be depressive. And, and you have the, the same person, the same individual can pass from one to another uh, situation. Um, then as somebody in Colombia told me one day, these are normal person in abnormal situation, and then we can consider that these are the, tra the, the mark of disidentification in, in the violence of the displacement and subjectivation, subjectivation in the making of the movement. And, uh, that's why you have all this, this uh, discourse about Adventure, an adventure, the adventure. This is an adventure. I am an adventure. So, some researchers have made the investigation about this, and it's quite interesting. When you see at this trajectory, you say these are these are pathetic uh, stories. These are so difficult and violent of um, disidentification, destruction of the person, and so on, and the people reinvent something. They, they, they build a narrative, which is a narrative of the adventure. When, how can they believe they are <laughs> in such wonderful adventure when they are living all this on this side? But yeah, it's part of the reality and I think this is the, the making of the subjectivity in this context. Okay. Yes, thank you, Michelle, for this interesting talk. I, I want to invite you to be more specific about what I believe is your main argument, and I have two sort of entries to that. I think there are at least three ways of studying what you are studying. Maybe there are more, but three are obvious. Either you focus on, on a camp, on one interstitial space, and then you look what happens there. Or you follow, follow a certain category of people as they go to different camps, or else you, you look at the, the camp and the interstitial space as such. And you have chosen the, the third one, but you you did not pay attention to a dimension of that, namely that this is, so to speak, a, a global arrangement, a global regime. The same technologies of running a camp are employed everywhere. And then there is UNHCR and many other organizations, so that that, that was not your concern. Your, your concern was to establish, so to speak, classical, classical sociological figures within this camp. And you introduced the paria and the stranger and the labyrinth, and, and, but then actually where you wanted to land is the cosmopolitan. And basically your argument is about displacing the cosmopolitan as a figure. And now I have to, relate to this, I have two questions. Can you look at this interstitial space in global dimension without looking at the regimes of regulation? And the second question is, okay, th that seems to be a very interesting project to sort of give the cosmopolitan figure a different meaning. But when you say that Agamben is exaggerating with the camp as a state of emergency, his exaggeration, in fact, goes much further. His, his point is that this is the figure of modernity. And I also believe that this is not just an exaggeration, but simply an error. However, his point is to sort of attribute to the person in this condition as something of the uh, homo sacer, as, as being out of everywhere. And when you now say, this in fact is the new form of cosmopolitanism, this is a very strong thesis, and it might be very interesting, but you, you, you put it so cautious as, as if this was something empirical, but it's very provocative, because then there are different figures of refugees, and some of them are displaced by force. And then to say this is a, the new emergence of cosmopolitanism is a strong argument, and I... I I would appreciate if you if you put that sharper in distinction to Agamben's uh, uh, argument. The, the, um, 
Yes, the first, first one, the, the regulation, I, I think, then I consider three kinds of, it, there could be more, but let's say three models of um, kind of spaces which are not all equals, but um, I think perhaps I, I don't agree with what you, you your interpretation. Uh, a squat is not a camp, it's not the same thing. And an informal encampment that the people create to find a refuge is not a refugee camp organized by, by UNHCR. There are links, yeah, I, I, I agree, I, I, I defend the idea that there are links on this, between all these spaces and all, all these spaces make probably something which is a huge borderland <laughs> or global borderland. Uh, but, um, uh, they are not. They are not equal. In terms of global re regulation, I think this is a global place for uh, people who are um, rejected of any every local situation. And if you put all this local together, then you find a global situation, which is where where do uh, the socially undesirable live? They live in the camp. There is some. Uh, uh, nuances or, or complexity more if you consider what I didn't consider here, which is the camp for workers like we have in Qatar or in Brazil or in India or in China, uh, where you have workers camp. And then, and then the camp can also be linked to a kind of um, government of the workers. Um, about the, the cosmopolitanism uh, opposed to the idea of the model of uh, Agamben, let's say the model of Agamben is the camp, all camp is the uh, locus of the geopolitic when the geopolitic has taken the place of the policy. Say the definition. No. Um, this doesn't work. What works is the idea of an exclusion and ex exception and exclusion, which is contained in this uh, definition. Perhaps there is a, a aim of control, the aim of control um, that, that comes globally, that comes from the national state. The, the camp is a production of the national state, which is the, the, the outside of the national state, so it's the camp. And, and, uh, and uh, the, the willing of, or the aim of making, um, the, making with the camp uh, an instrument of control doesn't, um, uh, doesn't first define all the function of the camp in terms of regulation or manifestation of power. And secondly, uh, doesn't, doesn't make any consideration of what is the experience of these places. And of course, Agamben is a philosopher, and like all the philosophers, he will say that the question of the verification is not his, it's for others. And then we go and make the verification and say, no, it doesn't work. Because <laughs> we can dialogue between ethnography and philosophy, and, uh, and we can say that these places are, are places of, of violence, for the people who are there, these are places of violence. Even the humanitarian camp is a place of violence. The people have been obliged to be there to be uh, to receive uh, the condition of survival, um, and it is also a, a place of sociability, of original sociability. I have, in other work, developed all this sociability of the refugee camp, and I, okay, I, I don't have the time to, to make it now. But my, my point is that in a squad like the Gaza Hospital squad in Beirut, there is also an encounter or many encounters of people coming from many stories, from many regions, from many uh, languages, and so on. That, that makes that this place is um, becoming a cosmopolitanism place, not 
cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitanism. It is creating the context, this context of being always in the border can become uh, progressively the context of the life of everybody. I think it, it is the global context. That is the global, the perfect global context is the context of border situation. When we are in a border and we are in a, in a, in a rational, urban, or cultural or social border, we are living something that is about the construction of the world or the common world. And um, yeah, and that's the that's the point. That's why I think it's interesting to to reverse the problematic and to take all these spaces of marginality, like spaces of border, and then therefore uh, spaces of creation of cosmopolitanist context. Michel? Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. I wanted to follow up with another question on disidentification to ask whether you might conceive of circumstances where a loss of identity could be a benefit, um, a sort of a purposive move to enable a better or a new life. Um, I'm thinking of, of maybe in the context of institutional or, or legal parameters that would benefit one nation over another or one national identity over another. Um, and then if it is a purposive move, then can we still consider it a process of disidentification or is there a different process at play? And then how would you link that to your concept of borderlands as a site of sort of emergent cosmopolitan? It could be the banality of this identification. Uh, I think this is the, the, perhaps the point is this. It is uh, the, uh, when you have what anthropologists now agree to say that you have a crisis, crisis of locality, crisis of culture, crisis of identity then the normal situation, uh, we can consider that being in situation of disidentification, being in exile is something which is more and more normal. It's not, an, it's not so much an, an, um, an, exceptional, an exceptional situation. Then on that moment, we can consider that it is a, a, a permanent hybrid, hybridation, hybridization and not the loss, the loss of the, not we can we could not characterize the situation as desidentification, but we could characterize that as places of hybridation, of cultural and social hybridation. I think that's why that the, the um, um, one of one of your authors I, I mentioned has developed the idea that the same um, the same uh, uh, tendencies of social science to get interest with migration was also interested with degradation, pesticides, uh, um, uh, and so on and so on. And um, yeah, uh, Contini, Contini in Mexico works about cultural degradation, he works on the border, on the, on the border of Mexico. And then uh, yeah, there is something there. Of, Taking this like the normal situation, like the, the normal order of things, then we could uh, consider Boisei that said many, many things about this also. When you live in exile, you live in the permanent recreation of something new, something you, you, you don't know. Then you are, you are in a cultural relation when you live in exile, um, even if you have lost something as you, you write so beautifully. You, you have always lost something, but the reality is, is that you are um, on cultural um, degradation permanently. Yeah. Uh, 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 thank you for the talk. Uh, it was really interesting, and I would like to uh, I would like to address the conceptual uh, part of that. Um, as, I mean, the, the part that relates to cosmopolitanism, because when Diogenes the Cynic for the first time used the word cosmopolites. Um, it referred, I mean, it meant the citizen of the world, right? In the, ancient, in the uh, context of ancient Greece, it was a, uh, kind of a paradoxical statement, but it referred somehow to membership. And when you uh, list your three kinds of, or three figures of the borderman, um, a wanderer, a paria, and a metic, 
I was wondering what kind of membership we are talking about uh, here, uh, especially given the fact that uh, a situation of a paria and a situation of a metic is to a large extent different, right? Because um, as you said, the, the metic is uh, economically useful, sometimes maybe even necessary, but socially undesirable. And the paria is just uh, like unwanted at all, right? Not even useful. So if you could uh, elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. yeah that's I think that which belonging of these three, it's a not belonging. Uh, that the, the definition, the common definition of the three figures is that it's, um, precisely they are out, they are, they are outside of the, the main, the main uh, uh, definition. The, the point is that the main definition is given by the national state nowadays and then it is all um, residual or superfluous um, people that we can consider in this modality of being a paria, uh, being a, a metek or being um, a wanderer, um, they are all outside the, the, the normal situation of thing and which is actually outside the definition of the citizen. The question is the citizen, the, the, the national citizen. The, the, situation, the, the question is, the belonging of them is the question which is a global question. Can they be considered like citizens of something else than the national state? That, that's the, all the crisis that we have nowadays in Europe, for example. It's not complicated to define that. This is the crisis of the national state. Both or all of the national state of departure, of transit and arrival. And people are wandering, uh, undesirable, uh, put apart by all these national states, and this makes a growing population. And this is the, in the measure that this population grows, the crisis of the national state grows. Vicky? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you about the images, um, and particularly to this last one. And then a one about people the people trying to get onto the truck. And I'm not sure if I understood the uh, heard correctly the account of this last image, of whether it was a moment of crossing the border. Is that is that right for this last this, one? This image yes, is in Melilla, Melilla in north of Morocco. And uh, Melilla is a Spanish enclave for tourists. Melilla and Ceuta are Spanish enclave in the north of uh, Africa, in the north of Morocco. And then it is a place where uh, migrants from West and Central Africa try to jump over uh, the, the bar barrier. So then my question is about the status of movement in the images and of kind of life in the this sort of alternative cosmopolitan life that you're talking about in the borderland. So the image of them trying to run to catch the truck, which was much earlier in the talk and terrific, I thought. But that is one where it was um, the movement was unfulfilled. That that is not, not crossing a movement, but remaining within the borderland and a different kind of um, kind of agency and not agency simultaneously. So I'm wondering about that. That kind of politics is very different from a slightly more triumphal politics in that final image of the hands out, ray, uh, out um, and of, at least in your account, of a, of a successful crossing. So I would have liked you to end on this image rather than the final one, but I'd like you to talk a little bit about the status of the crossing versus movement internally within the camp. Are you sure you're getting an accurate question? He's going to answer our questions now. Well, it's just the English. That's okay. Um, I wanted to show this image because, but it's not complete. 
the story that I, the situation that I described, it's not possible in a photography to describe it uh, with the car of policemen and the people in the in the fitness club. Um, but this this is an, an image I wanted to put here because uh, we had many discussion with Sahar Christiani, which is the photographer and uh, the coordinator of Legal Hope, who was making this investigation with me. And she she thought that I was a bit uh, obsessed by this fact that these young migrants were running behind the tracks and never succeed to get in the tracks. And I know that. But what are they doing every day? This bothered me. This um, that's uh, exasperated. <laughs> this you know when you are beside these people, they are always because this one don't pass the border, and the other one they pass the border. That's the difference. My 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 politics of the image in this uh, presentation. Uh, the first one is that this this one are just beside some matters beside the encampment I, I spoke about after the encampment of Patras uh, perhaps these especially persons are here since many months perhaps more than one year and they repeat always the same the same ritual and they are stuck exactly in the border uh, some people of the encampment work in uh, the agriculture around Patras, so that some people can succeed to have some money to buy food, and they have uh, help from uh, uh, Doctor Without Border Greek section of Doctor Without Border, which is was in that moment inside the encampment, and it's near the encampment, and um, and they and they never succeed to pass. That's that's why I, I put this um, image and. Uh, these one are of the same investigation in uh, Europe with the uh, Afghan people uh, who are in Paris or uh, Calais. These one are people who, who have established an encampment in the center of Paris in a square, square Vilma during two years. This is in Calais. And, um, um, and the last, the last, um, the last uh, photo is because they yes, succeed, yes. they succeed to pass the border. Yeah. But that—that's my concern. Is that changes the whole uh, politics of the talk for me for, to end on this image? All the other images are about the encampment, yes, and this yes, one is about yeah. exit. No, I feel I like understand. that. I, I, yeah, I am. Yeah. Yeah. We should. Talk. I should show the the film because there is a film if you look for internet. Spoke about there is uh, circulating in internet a film that had been made by uh, journalists who were there in their car, and they and they filmed people after they jumped the the barrier, and they ran in the city of uh, Belia, in this case, and they arrive to another place which is the retention center for the migrants, and they are happy to be there and they are happy to enter in this retention center because they are in Europe also, although they are in the African continent, but they are administratively in Europe. And then they enter another police center and they are happy to be there and then they say, okay, we are out of Africa. It's, very, it's a very pathetical uh, film, but, uh, but it is the same sequence. Yeah. But that means that after this jumping, they didn't finish. Yeah. They didn't finish. The, the okay, uh, we have many questions, but uh, we are going to also to exercise our prerogatives. <laughs> there will be one question by Miriam now, and then one question by myself, and then <laughs> back to you. I think the proper existence of this uh, 
people occupying these places is political. Is on the, on the final, on the final there is um, occupation of these places. Like when you have um, an encampment of people, they are making an encampment of on, on the on the middle, on the center of the city, and when they are expulsed once, twice, three times, four times, and they come back and they say, we occupy this place. This is the political moment of this. When this um, um, place making is becoming an occupation, an, occupa an occupation of the space. And then they, they impose, I mean, what we see in Europe, I, I don't know exactly if it's this, I think it's a bit different from the United States with um, South American movement. But the situation we have in Europe, in the relation, in the post-colonial relation of Europe with Africa and with Orientalism, Middle East, um, is that there is something which is very, um, you can consider aggressive, there is an aggressivity or positive aggressivity, which is the aggressivity of the subject in the movement of these people. They occupy places where every, everybody, everything tells them you have not the right to be there, you have not the right, you will die, and they die. And they continue to go there, and they continue to be there. Then, uh, for me, I think this is a political subject. And I know it's perhaps they are not politicized subject in the meaning of having political projects, but it's political in the meaning that they know that they are against the state, the national state, and they are, and there is a conflict, and they are inside the conflict. I think this is a, this image here also is an image of the conflict. Yes, I think it's a, it's a follow-up uh, to this, to Miriam's, but all the questions. Um, it sounds something paradoxical in your talk. Uh, that you define um, uh, these figures of uh, the border men of the border people always negatively. So no place, no link, no goods, no relations, there's an identification. So it's always a negative definition, out of which uh, you want to extract uh, a positive meaning that will be the cosmopolitan in the way you define it. So out of negativity, of a void and absence, something positive. And I'm, I'm not certain that at least conceptually this can be done if uh, you don't emphasize more this last point you made, that maybe uh, the, the, the fact of, of causing border, borders has a positive connotation. Uh, it is uh, the, the, the act of cosmopolitanism by breaking away these enclosures, these spatial enclosures, even if it's not a political project, it's not um, a intentional political act. It has a deep positive content because it destabilizes existing divisions and it shows a kind of uh, a different kind of unity from below. So I was wondering uh, why you don't want to make, uh, maybe because of the question of Richard, why you don't want to make this positive content uh, uh, more, more central? Uh, a politics without, uh, I don't know, uh, intentions or a politics of uh, effects, uh, not of motivations. But otherwise, I don't know what, what cosmopolitanism it would be just uh, an empty place, uh, uh, a void. Yeah, um, it is also a place of conflict. I, I Perhaps I was not clear, but the definition of the border situation is always a definition of conflict about the cohabitation between Israel and Palestine, for example. There are many tentatives to say, how, how can we define the proper situation of the encounter, which is on the, on the border? And then when I say that this is a cosmopolitan situation or place, it means that it is not exactly, the conflict is not exactly uh, multiculturalist, it's not a conflict of uh, an Afghan against the French, because this doesn't exist. It's a conflict inside the border with people who have already, who, who are already um, um, experienced all the uh, knowledge or many of the knowledge of the different places where they have passed, or they are they are transformed. They are 
kind of cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism. And then all the people who are here not are not in a multicultural situation, they are in a cosmopolitan uh, situation. And this makes a difference for on my on my uh, point of view, because I think the uh, the, the the negotiation or, or the politics that can be developed in this situation um, uh, could have to uh, consider that the context is a cosmopolitan, a cosmopolitan context. The people are in the same context. They are not in two different contexts. They are in the same in the same uh, context. Then, then we arrive on the main point that we of desidentification, but it's also a desidentification of my proper analysis of desethnicization or denationalization of my analysis when I consider, for example, like um, uh, Zizek that who makes me think is a subject who, who comes from outside. If there's not something that comes from outside that obliges me to think, I will not think. <laughs> I don't think magically I think because something a subject from outside obliging me to think something, and then the subject here is the is is the one that appears in this border situation and obliged the one to, to to think and to and to change or and to negotiate, and that makes what is politic. Yeah, on this on this point I I agree completely, but it's more what arrives in the conclusion perhaps I should emphasize more. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, I was wondering why you did not include the illegal immigrants from San Papier irregulars in Europe, in France, but you, you limited the Metec uh, case in Beirut. Uh, so, like, I mean, in, in the examples that you gave on Paris, it was more on the camp uh, cases, for example. Secondly, you said, like, uh, that the political is the moment of uh, crossing the border. But I was wondering, like the political moment, the political, the political economic moment that uh, shapes and constructs the border management. So there is a political economic rationale behind, which defines which mobility is legal or illegal. So I was wondering the whole like I mean, political economic rationale behind what makes uh, it's like as far as I understood you kind of like underestimate the post-colonial situation in Europe in terms of the like border management like and especially it's like in, since the early 2000s like Europe defined migration as a threat to itself and it's like I mean has a whole. Uh, global efforts to migration, which integrates the African countries into the fight against illegality and everything. So um, I was wondering if you could just like I mean, reflect on the political economy and Europe as the uh, border management uh, actor and the METEC uh, in France or in the center of Europe. Yes, I. Uh... I agree. The, the, of course, um, the figure of the METEC is available for illegal, um, the situation of illegal migrants in, in France and Europe. I just took one example I think it, I, because I know better some situations in Beirut, but uh, I think that the, 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 the situation of 300,000 or 350,000 uh, illegal migrant workers in France, for example, that we have since 20 or 30 years, it didn't move. All the, even with all these politics who are close the border, etc., we have still more or less 350,000 illegal workers. Um, um, they are, of course, in this situation of metech. They are useful. They are economically useful and socially undesirable. So sometimes they are even citizens. So the discrimination actually goes beyond the, like, I mean, there is a, like the colonial migrants who has citizenship face also the same, uh, like, being in 
inside but outside kind of like blurred situation so that belonging, that tension like it exceeds I guess. And um, yeah, and of course this is there is all of the political economy of uh, in Europe to, to to organize also on the point of view of the labor market this um, uh, migration. I think that one of the one of the reason why some people succeed to pass is uh, or why there is uh, smugglers that succeed to work is that uh, one uh, they. Um, they, in, they, they prevent the possibility of riots, <laughs> bigger riots, and two, uh, they are uh, useful for the economy in uh, Europe. Okay, because we're running out of time, uh, we will combine a few questions. So two now, and then uh, three in the last uh, in the last round. So uh, Emmanuel and Sara, and then uh, we have the last uh, three. Oh, thank you. It was really thought provoking. I am, I, my question is related to what Miriam was saying before. Uh, what it seems from your picture and what you're saying is that what I think is missing is that these figures are also always hunted. And uh, you don't seem to address that. You address some surveillance and police in the Greek case at first, but then it seems like they're no longer hunted. And uh, maybe it's because you don't want to fall into the trap, in a Gambian trap of that these are perpetually hunted, so they're not political. But then I'm going to steal something that Patrick once said to me, that fleeing is also political. That they wander, that because they're wandering, they're also escaping. And the act of escaping is a political act. And that's Thanks. Sarah? Um, yes, also thank you for the really great talk. I was more with relevance to the image of the wanderer, wondering if there's something uniquely gendered um, you mentioned border woman, border man, but the images I see of migrants are predominantly male. And so what kind of privilege is entailed with even being able to escape or, you know, the self-identification of a person who is fleeing um, in a gendered context? Um, yeah, most of the people are, most of the persons are in a situation of being hunted. Yeah. Um, I think I, 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 some in some parts of the speech I talk about being uh, threatened, being, being in danger, being uh, threatened, and the space of the border is a, a space of, of um, threat, threat, and. Um, Police is always not very far in all all these situations, um, and uh, I think it's part of the conflict. That's why perhaps we can say that the own the the, the, the own presence in these spaces is a political presence because they have the police as a response, and, and it's a an element of uh, explication of the fact that it is a political um, uh, situation. And um, yeah, there is um, many gender uh, differentiation, and of course, there are um, there are many examples I could give, but it's not it's not the time. But in refugees camp, the women have a very strong plays role and many times a political role. Uh, they are uh, among the people who are the most legitimate in a refugee camp because it is supposed the, uh, the figure of the refugee and Miriam knows it well is a woman, not a woman who is wounded and who is needing, needing uh, who needs something, who needs help. And then there are some situations where some women using this uh, privilege of being the ideal figure of the refugee uh, go to um, some um, more reivindication manifest demonstration and that there is some stories in the refugee scalp where um, women organize some demonstration or kidnapping of humanitarian workers 
to ask for better condition of living and so on. And then they are uh, among uh, political uh, political subjects. When I when I tell the story of the squat in Gaza hospital, I'll tell you that it was opened by three women from going out of uh, Shatila camp because they were um, wandering in Sabra neighborhood to look for a place to live. And in the same meaning, because they had to ask for the Syrian soldier authorization to get inside the building. And uh, uh, we can imagine that for being a woman with children and wandering in the neighborhood, they have been allowed, they, they, have, been, they have been authorized by the Syrian soldier to enter in this uh, empty building, and um, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I don't. I didn't respond. So, what does it mean on on the figure of border men being border women? Um, it I is. Think it is. People better. <laughs> border human. Oh, border yes. people. Border people. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Other people. <laughs> um, okay, the last two, uh, Erdik and uh, Matthias. Okay, so yeah, I'm a bit think... loud because you are too far. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is like kind of <coughs> referring to the main discussion here. It's about the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the image that the running people with like people running behind the truck. Uh, you described that image as like a ritual of. Uh, of uh, the immigrants, uh, but like as a spectator, maybe like if you're like the one watching the scene that what's happening, uh, or maybe like as an ethnographer or as ethnographers in general, uh, why do you describe that that uh, uh, activity as a as a ritual, and what what is the significance of that to your project in a, in, a, in, a, in large terms? And my second question is about cosmopolitanism. Uh, you know, in the literature, like people, whoever writes about cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism try to identify the real cosmopolitan, like the Gibbs cosmopolitan, or like the middle class, or like who are flying uh, around the world are cosmopolitans. And you say, no, they are not cosmopolitans, but the immigrants, the refugees <coughs> are cosmopolitans. Uh, but I don't see the significance of identifying them, like giving them, attributing them the cosmopolitan name uh, in your project. I mean, I, do, 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 do you, do you, what is the significance of being a cosmopolitan person in a refugee camp, for example? Um, because, you, I mean, you know, like either in Lebanon or Gaza, in one of the squads, people describe themselves as cosmopolitan in misery. I mean, this sounds to me a little bit like that they're ridiculing the very concept of cosmopolitan. Uh, I don't know, it's just maybe I'm, I'm wrong, so. Yes? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I have a bit of a, well, a bit of a dilemma perhaps rather than a question. I, I very much sympathize with the uh, perspective that you give here. I think it's uh, much more uh, empowering in the sense of presenting the, the border people as, as a political subject rather than the uh, victimizing image that is often presented uh, in, in the media. Um, one of the problems that I have, however, is uh, this goes back to, to experience I had as, as a squatter in the Netherlands, as a, as a member of the squatters movement, uh, where uh, we, I mean, this because the squatters movement in, in, in the Netherlands, but in general in Europe, is of course not not it's it's got kind of diverse movements as well. It's also people involved there who are citizens who have a passport who basically uh, see squatting as a means of, of political action and do it voluntarily by choice. Uh, so who choose to live that life, perhaps even aestheticize it a bit. Uh, um, so I, I lived with 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 illegalized migrants in squats. Um, and what I what I experienced there is a there's a very strong uh, difference of perspective on, on what we were actually doing there. Uh, of course, uh, it was a means of of, of, of uh, acquiring a house, of of of, of, of um, uh, meeting certain basic uh, basic needs that we all had. 
but for us, for or for us, for for for, for Dutch uh, students who, who who chose this as a means of action, it was actually a choice uh, for for some of our illegalized uh, housemates or, or or neighbors. It wasn't, and they made abundantly clear that um, that they, the last thing they wanted was to stay there, was to be a squatter. It was just a means of survival, uh, and I mean. This led to a lot of confusion within this movement, a lot of tension in that sense, because there was a lot of misunderstanding about that. The point is, the the uh, um, uh, for for them to, to for these housemates want to have a let's say a proper house, to have a proper life, a normal life, so to speak, was much more important than just having this proper life. Life it was a it was a matter of, of being recognized. It was a member of uh, a matter of being member of a political community, etc. So they never really aestheticized this position they were in as much as, as we did. Uh, they 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 wanted to have the average Dutch citizen's life rather than the uh, the the border the border uh, uh, human life. So that that would be my the problem I have is aren't we aestheticizing it from the perspective of people who perhaps voluntarily. Uh, uh, identify with certain forms of resistance that these people don't choose for, uh, and that they actually want to get rid of as soon as possible. And no, I agree that uh, no one of the people who are in this situation, from this situation, uh, no one wants to be illegal, and, um, and no one wants to live in a country, for example. Um, and, um, and uh, the situation of illegal migrants in uh, European cities is a very complicated life, like everyday life, uh, by threatening of some places you can go, other you cannot go, and uh, the threatening of the police control. And on everyday life, it's very, it's very complicated. Coming back to this point, I think this is a political subject in in the meaning that their presence is politically disturbing the order, the political and identity order of the countries in Europe or in the first world in general. Um, um, of course, the motivation of everyone there is to have a good life and a family and a wage and so on. But the thing, that happens if even if the people didn't want to be there, they organize last lasting lasting time, they organize their life because they have to organize it in these places. And it's interesting that the question of is possible to build a good life in a precarious life, for example, is a question that appears uh, very explicitly in this uh, Gaza Hospital squad, for example, the first thing I saw when I arrived in this squad was an announcement of a, a fitness club which was on the sub subsol, sub on the uh, space and the basement uh, of the of the building, and they didn't they made it because they wanted to build their, their body and uh, to, to make that people from the neighborhood who to come on in the building in the squat and not consider it like a horrible place with illegal person and so on after some, one year of trying after building all this um, all this uh, club and uh, one year of trying to make it work and it didn't work and there was no clients and then they transformed the place and they made uh, rooms for uh, migrants from Bangladesh but it's, it works much much better in the same in the same aspect then I mean I mean um, even if the people don't want don't like this life and don't like this situation there is a moment where the question of having a good life in a precarious life is uh, is be becomes um, important um, um, I 
you forgot the, the other point. Yes. Um, um, well, sorry. I, 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 why, what do we gain by, by calling them cosmopolitan? Oh, yeah. Why, why, why call them cosmopolitanism? Because I think there is, I think there is a conflict about what is cosmopolitanism. If you read uh, Sigmund Bauman, for example, it's very interesting. He's, he writes about the global, who are um, this global class, who is very visible, and the local, who are all the other people in the world, who are looking at the global and with admiration and willing them. The spectacle, the spectacle of the cosmopolitan, of the so-called cosmopolitan. Um, and it's interesting to see that though the local is also the one that moves and he, move, he she moves with much more difficulties and then he, he she made the experience of the roughness of the world when you are in this global sphere you have no difficulty to circulate and to and you don't move you don't move you don't change of culture you don't change of language, you don't change of way of life. It's all the same. The people um, uh, who are in Bowman language, the locals, they are moving also, but in, in the condition of making the experience of the world. And then I, I, I think there is a conflict about this. They say, are cosmopolitanists, are cosmopolitan, the one who made the experience? Uh, the real experience of the world. Yes. Oh, I just want to thank you so much for coming and taking the questions. Thank you. Uh,